things that a man could do would be to take into his household a widow or a divorced woman, a woman who otherwise would be out on the streets. So you could say that there's two categories in which the prophet's wives fall. There are the mercy marriages and there are the peace marriages. Let's propose that as a basic criterion. There are those who he marries out of mercy and there are those who he marries in order to cement an alliance with the tribe with whom there would otherwise be a conflict. Remember the big picture and Montgomery, Montgomery Watts' later book is Muhammad, prophet and statesman. This is a great political achievement to unite Arabia, which nobody has united before ever, a land of warring factions and tribes, a land of pagans, difficult people, uh, to unite them in 23 years so successfully that that unity survives his demise, one of the great political success stories in history. Montgomery what points out as he goes through the list of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, the prophet's wives, is that each one of these wives, he says, was uh, involved in a political marriage. That's his interpretation. So he says, uh, I can find it. It is not too much to say that all Muhammad's marriages had a political aspect. He did not enter into marriages except when they were politically and socially desirable. That's his explanation of the otherwise extraordinary success of the Sirah. He starts out as a rejected preacher in the city of Mecca, his own people chuck him out. Within 23 years, he's the ruler of Arabia and he's united his people. Strategic marriages, which were part and parcel of the ancient world, were very much part of that. So, for instance, uh, he marries into the families of his closest associates. And you think particularly of Hafsa, who's a widow, her husband has been killed at the Battle of Badr. She is the daughter of Omar. So by marrying the daughter of Omar ibn Khattab, who becomes the second Khalifa, he has already uh, established um, a political nucleus. Similarly, the other wife uh, of one of the companions is, uh, daughter of one of the companions is, is Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr. So his two closest associates, he cemented that connection by marrying their daughters. Aisha was the only one of his wives who had not been previously married. The others were, were widows. Other examples. Juwairiya bint al-Harith. She was the daughter of the chief of the Bani al-Mustaliq, one of the factions of the tribe of Khuzara, who were constantly raiding and in a feuding situation with the early Muslim state in Medina. By cementing that union, Khuzara then became allies. Um Habiba is the daughter of Abu Sufyan, who is who? His arch enemy in the city of Mecca. Uh, and he marries her in 6 to 8 on his return from Khaybar. She's in her mid or late 30s. Um, and she has already been married to Ubaidullah bin Jahsh, radiallahu anhu, had made hijra to Abyssinia with her. He dies, and the Prophet وسلم, marries her, thereby marrying into the family of the um, idolatrous elite in the city of Mecca, uh, an event that's then going to have very momentous consequences. Maimona bint al-Harith, uh, in her late 20s, she is one of those who presented themselves to the Prophet for, for marriage. And again, in the category of political marriages, her brother-in-law was the Prophet's uncle, al-Abbas. So again, he's cementing, uh, in Montgomery Watt's view, a key connection with uh, uh, one of the elite families in Mecca. Safiya bin Khoyei is Jewish but converts to Islam and is the daughter of um, the leader of one of the big Jewish pri uh, tribes, which is to show, according to the chroniclers, not only that he's now going to be in a politically positive relationship with that tribe, but also that it's possible to marry outside a particular Arabian context. There's nothing wrong with marrying a, a Gentile. Uh, there's going to be no Arab prejudice. That's another important uh, precedent. Sauda bin Zama um, shows many things. She's in her 40s. She's a widow of Sakran bin Amr. She's also been on the Hijra to Abyssinia and returned. Her brother was one of the most important pagans in Mecca. 
Um, and they were also from the Banu Muttalib, so quite close to the Prophet's family. Um, and she's regarded as being an example of how it's permissible to marry people whose skins are darker than your own, because she was black. Um, and therefore that becomes an important precedent in, in Sharia. There's no obstacle to doing that. Other examples. Um Salama, one of the best known of the uh, hadith transmitters amongst the Prophet's wives. She's from the Makhzum clan. He also needs to win them over. She's a widow. She already has many children. Uh, so you can say that this is an example of both. It's a mercy marriage because she's a widow, she's got lots of children. But also, a political marriage because uh, she's very close to the leaders of Makhzum, who are one of the dominant tribes in, in Mecca. And once Mecca has fallen and the uh, Muslim rule has been established there, these strategic marriages become hugely important in winning over the chieftains of, of Quraysh to the, the, the new religion. Um, other examples could be cited. Um, Zainab bin Jahsh is a case that's uh, uh, famous because it's often misunderstood. She's aged 38. Um, there are arguments, but probably that's, that's her age. You have to remember, in those times and before air conditioning, uh, to be aged 38 then probably meant that you looked um, quite a bit older. Uh, and this, his marriage to her is the famous occasion of, of a revelation of the Quranic text. Uh, she is a widow, she comes from Medina, she is asked, she is asked to marry Zayd bin Haritha, who is uh, the adopted son of, of the Prophet The famous incident is that the Prophet goes to Zayd's house, he is not there, she comes out, and he sees her, and he says, uh, Subhanallah, Mughayr al-Qulub, pray 